not part of it, I promise. <laughs> wow, thank you. What an awesome start to Women Ignite 2017. Thank you. What an honor, truly an honor, to be here with all of you incredible leaders in your community. Let's see if I can get this. There, we'll just start. Just got back two months ago from a short little deployment in South Korea. I'm still serving in the Air Force Reserves. Today I want to talk about leadership, and your leadership is more important now than ever. I want to encourage you with some fun stories about my experiences as a female pilot and some things I've learned about the unique significance of women in leadership positions such as yourselves. So let me start with this question. How many of you really truly feel like you're a leader right now in your community? Awesome. Some say good leaders are born that way while others have learned through experience that good leadership is learned over years of practice. I fall somewhere in the middle of that continuum. I don't think I was necessarily born a leader, but I was born big. As a newborn, I weighed in right under 10 pounds, and I was fully grown at 5'9 and 160 pounds at the age of 10. I distinctly remember the kids on the playground coming up to me and they approached me because they thought I was the teacher. But instead of politely informing them that I was not the teacher, I used my size to ensure justice was administered. <laughs> my first lessons on becoming a leader included fairly enforcing dodgeball rules. One day when I was about 13, we were living in Idaho Falls at the time, and my dad announced, well, honey, it doesn't look like you're going to be a ballerina, so let's hit the gym. And that's when I started learning, and we actually started attending the local YMCA. And I started to discover the importance of finding your natural, God-given talent, and then using it to help serve others. For me, it was powerlifting. It's not every day in the gym that you see a 13-year-old girl bench-pressing 45-pound plates for 10 reps. And I loved being strong. I learned vital lessons about self-discipline, goal-setting, and how to push my body to the limits, both mentally and physically, all things that would help me later. I went on to break state, national, and even world records, as they mentioned in my bio. I was, just wanted to use what I was given and make the best of it. My junior year, I attended a leadership conference in Sun Valley, and toward the end of the course, they told us that one of the course completion requirements was that we had to perform a talent on stage in front of all the other high school students. I was mortified. I did not have any talents. But that's when a friend who knew I was a weightlifter proposed the idea, the human bench press. So we took the stage, and two spotters lifted his toothpick-like 140-pound body up onto my arms, and I bench pressed him multiple times. <laughs> the crowd loved it. The cool thing is that he, too, went on to graduate from the Air Force Academy and to become an F-16 fighter pilot. But I doubt he shares the story about being bench pressed by a girl, <laughs> let alone an A-10 pilot. There's a bit of a rivalry there. <laughs> but he definitely taught me the lesson that day, that good leaders identify the talents of others. And I found that it's actually women leaders who naturally identify these leadership traits in others. Well, I kept weightlifting once I got to the Air Force Academy both as part of our track and field workouts, but also competitively. My reputation as being strong followed me to pilot training, and in a predominantly male career field, weightlifting was a way for me to earn respect amongst the guys. One by one, they would each see me in the gym with 400 pounds on the bar, and respect was earned instantly. The old argument of a woman in combat not being able to carry her own weight sure didn't apply to me. I still chuckle that it probably never dawned on most of those guys that women are naturally stronger in their glutes and quads. But who would have known that a talent that I found right here in Idaho at age 13 would go on to show the case, the importance of strong women across the world? So how strong of a woman do you have to be to end up becoming a fighter pilot? 
Well, I ran a few quick numbers, just so you can see, see the statistics. Oh, and there we go, back one. The Air Force Academy class of 2005, there are about 922 of us that graduated. About 522 went on to pilot training. I don't know exactly how many of my male classmates became fighter pilots, but I do know that there were only three of us women who went on to become fighter pilots. And during my training at the academy, every, and then at pilot training, every flight, simulator, class, and ground training event was graded, and all of our scores were compiled. The person with the highest, and get rid of that slide. The person with the highest score got to choose what plane they wanted to fly. And usually, the top four or five selected fighters. I spent a lot of time contemplating which aircraft I wanted to spend my career flying. In making that decision, I fondly remember hearing stories about troops on the ground being pinned down by the enemy. And the number one aircraft they called in was the A-10 Warthog. I saw the A-10 as an opportunity for me to help serve those soldiers on the ground. And that's what I really felt called to do, was to become a servant leader. Interestingly, I've noticed that it's women who predominantly fall into servant leader positions. So one last slide showing statistics. I just, the last one was all about, there we go, and the actual Air Force wide, the total number of pilots about 12,600, about 2,700 of those fighter pilots, and there again about 90 are women. But honestly, it wasn't the being a, a small statistic that was interesting to me. The real reason I wanted to fly the A-10 was because it was a single-seat fighter aircraft, and it was built around a huge Gatling gun that shoots 30-millimeter rounds, that looks something like this. We can shoot with the A-10 50 of these per second. So after two years of pilot training and eight months of employing these, learning how to employ these, you probably wouldn't believe you, you probably wouldn't believe me if I told you that I almost got removed from A-10 training. Being the only woman was not easy. Through many trials, I learned that women learn differently, we communicate differently, we adapt to failure differently, and we have different competitive styles. So for instance, one time I was flying along at 400 miles per hour, and I didn't correct my altitude from 490 feet above the ground back up to 500 feet, which was the minimum, quickly enough. So my boss had lots of meetings about my inability to hack it, and every bomb and bullet that we dropped for eight months was graded for error and distance from the target. This was essentially the science of pickling. Pickling is when you push the red button to release a bomb. So pickling too soon would mean that your bomb would be short, and pickling too late would mean that your bomb would be too long. It felt like every instructor gave me a piece of his mind about how I wasn't quite cutting it. In the meantime, all six of my classmates would come back from their sorties and boast about how they had shacked the target every time. <laughs> and I quietly wondered if maybe God had a different plan for me and this wasn't my calling. But I did make it to graduation day. And on graduation day, I timidly stood next to the A-10, thankful to have made it to that position. And I was ready to get the heck out of there. So families filled the room with standing room only, and in the back lined up were all my instructors, and it seemed like they were grimacing a little bit that I was there. And the wing commander stepped forward to present the much coveted Top Gun Award to the pilot whose bombs and bullets had hit the target the closest through the entire eight month training point. You could have heard a pin drop when my name was called as the winner. <laughs> I definitely learned a lot that day, but what I learned is that we are stronger than we realize, and never underestimate your capabilities as a front runner. 
especially when you're the most under fire. <laughs> Looking back, well, I was transporting some A-10s to the theater, and during a one-night layover, I was jet-lagging, and I decided to hit the, middle, to hit the gym in the middle of the night. That particular gym had a weightlifting incentive program that if you could bench press 200 pounds, you could get a free T-shirt. Why not? So after warming up with, you know, 200 pounds for a few minutes, I went in and I asked the attendant to come in and watch me lift so I could claim my free T-shirt. She was a small woman, and she told me that I'd have to find a spotter because she was worried she wouldn't be able to lift the weight if I couldn't do it. And then, out of the middle of nowhere, this guy in the back of the gym piped up, and he said, she doesn't need a spotter. She just did that several times without even worrying about it. So I took home my free T-shirt, and of course, it didn't take the guys long to notice my new T-shirt. And it was that T-shirt that soon earned me the call sign of Altoid, because I'm curiously strong, as the slogan <laughs> suggests. Looking back on the nearly 1,000 hours I spent flying through the skies of Afghanistan, there are lots of stories worth sharing with you today. But there was one time when the Taliban were neutralized at the Battle of Dohab, and it turned into a 13-hour ground fight for our guys on the ground. The Joint Terminal Attack Controller, who had actually previously served in the Idaho Air National Guard here at Gowan Field, he called in airstrikes from 14 different airframe from all four services, and not one American was killed. On several occasions, we provided coverage during the Kabul embassy attack. And there was the one time I had an engine failure, 150 miles south of Kabul. I spent, it was a little struggling, yeah, I struggled to get back up, climbing over the 16,000 foot mountains, but finally got my crew home safely. I spent many hours providing overwatch after a Chinook helicopter was shot out of the sky with a rocket-propelled grenade, killing 17 Navy SEALs from SEAL Team 6, among others. And I remember starting up my engines one cool, dark morning when I watched an Osprey taxi by me with Osama bin Laden's body. Those were the reasons why we kept an American flag in the front windscreen of our aircraft, a constant reminder of the meaning of the red, white, and blue. And those are the reasons why I still fly a flag on my porch to this day, because patriotism is contagious. Yeah. <laughs> Returning home after three separate deployments proved to be more challenging than living in a combat zone. As I personally sorted through the injustices that I had witnessed, the friends that I watched die, and the fellow pilots who didn't return home with me. I was still responsible for leading fellow airmen who didn't have the curiously strong coping skills that I had developed. I saw officers forced into morally compromising situations because of failed bureaucratic paperwork. I saw young women shunned and careers destroyed because they didn't know how to emotionally process the horrors of war. And I listened to countless stories from colleagues whose wives had left them and alcohol became their only way of dealing with the indescribable emotions. And I waited through the process of filing VA paperwork for both myself and others, because most of them didn't know how to process the government paperwork, and many were even ashamed to try. Yet I found as a female leader, I was the one that fellow soldiers felt comfortable talking to about these uncomfortable situations. And I was the one who had the relationship building skills to know how to help others process and mend those moral injuries. And I was often the only one in the room who was compassionate, non-judgmental, and was not a threat to their masculinity. Ladies, as strong female leaders, our impact is more than production numbers on paper. A strong female leader is needed in tough, unsolvable situations. I learned how important it is, as women leaders, to share our own battlefield experiences to help other women and men grow. Our women leaders are the ones who need to define and exude what it means to be strong. What I have found in my experiences, having been taught leadership skills in a male-dominated environment, is that women actually have specific leadership qualities that our country is thirsty for. It's our women who have high levels of emotional intelligence, who communicate more effectively to diverse audiences, who raise awareness of moral standards, and who instill honor and character, who have the patience to provide individual coaching, 
and mentoring for followers, and it's our women who are constantly striving to make things better. Shout out to Shelly G. <laughs> I became acutely aware of these specific female leadership qualities when they were totally absent during my situations in life where I was the only female present. And believe me when I say it's obvious when it's missing. I thought I'd share just a handful of these stories about how women's leadership abilities are unique. Number one, women leaders are resourceful. We usually take what we have and we make it something great out of it. I was in Arizona about halfway through my A-10 training when my squadron commander came up to me at the operations desk and he asked to see me in his office. Instantly, I was on high alert. He closed the door and proceeded to tell me that he had never led a female fighter pilot before and that he wanted to make sure that I knew how to pee while flying the A-10. The men had easy to use piddle packs, which had an opening about the size of a quarter. And flight suits were specifically designed by men for men. And there were two zippers, one at the top to get into, and then one at the bottom where you could zip up just enough to whip it out, fill a piddle pack, all while flying to not interrupt your flying capabilities. <laughs> he wanted me to figure out a way to do that. So he suggested a catheter. And then he suggested a diaper. And both of those didn't seem like good options to me. So mom came to the rescue and together we came up with a method that broke Air Force regulations, don't tell anyone, that we sew a, sewed a hidden zipper in the undercarriage of my flight suits. And let me assure you, after flying 10 hours over the Atlantic and another seven hours over the Mediterranean, I sure am glad I didn't settle with the diaper option. <laughs> But women are resourceful, and we're uniquely skilled, and that aspect of our leadership helps us make miracles happen. And many of you in this room are already doing more with very few resources. Number two, women leaders are communication experts. Ladies, know the power of your voice. The men do listen to us. Now, gentlemen may disagree with me, but hear me out. An average A-10 costs about $20 million with all the new upgrades in avionics. Essentially, every piece of information needed to employ a weapon appears in the heads-up screen in front of you. So if while as a pilot you're flying and you're looking at the heads-up display and you encounter a potentially lethal situation such as coming in contact with the ground or terrain next to you, the system will provide an automatic cue that sounds off in your headset. And it sounds, and it's always, in a female voice. And it sounds something like this. Pull up, pull up or eject, eject. <laughs> the official term the guys use for this is bleep and Betty. And it's always a female voice. And during the training, they taught us that it's actually behavioral scientists and engineers discovered that men react more quickly in a high stress situation to a female voice. <laughs> Ladies, use your voices wisely. I also found it interesting that while I was training to become a pilot, every day we were graded on communication. My male instructors made it a point to tell us women to lower our voices on the radio. They told us it made us sound more professional and that people would listen to us if we low, used a lower octave. I spent months and years trying to lower my voice on the radio. I left training sounding like Darth Vader on the radio. <laughs> But a funny thing happened, once I deployed overseas and I started talking on the radio frequently, I'd be flying over remote parts of Afghanistan, checking in with troops on the ground. Some of those troops, Navy SEALs, Rangers, Special Ops guys, who had been out in the desert for weeks and had not interacted with women. Do you think they, no, let me start over. <laughs> when I checked in on the radio, I have never heard so many grown men want to talk. Do you think they want to hear my Darth Vader voice? <laughs> nope. Ladies, you have a lot of power with your voice. Choose your words wisely, be true to yourself, and use your voice to make a difference. Number three, women leaders are encouragers. In the Air Force, we often refer to the importance of having a wingman. When flying in formation with another aircraft, your wingman is the one that flies three to six inches away from your wing and is always there to provide mutual support. When I found myself alone and 
as the only female fighter pilot in my squadron, I discovered how much I valued having another woman around. Having grown up secretly despising the color pink, I suddenly became fond of it, since all the guys in the squadron seemed to be allergic to pink. They wouldn't even touch something that was pink. So that's when I started recognizing the new value of pink and that feminine perspective. Having a woman on your wing brings a much needed feminine perspective to one, help you navigate emotions, and two, to build your confidence. I can remember being in pilot training with what I would call an emotional roommate at the time. And I had a really rough day. I had just failed a sortie. The guys were backstabbing, trying to find a way to get me to fail so that one of them could get the fighter pilot slot that we were all striving for. And I drove home thinking, what have I gotten myself into? This, this is just not, not working. I can't do this anymore. As soon as my roommate got home, she broke into tears. And I thought, oh my gosh, what happened to her? And she shared what she was actually feeling about the challenges of her day and how impossible this whole thing of pilot training was. And we both broke into tears together as we stood in front of the washer and dryer in the kitchen. And we both conspired that we would quit tomorrow. But when we woke up feeling better the next day, we decided we could tough it out one more day and maybe quit next week. I use that story to just explain how having a woman, a woman on your wing allows you to navigate those really tough emotional situations. And having a woman on your wing also boosts your confidence. I can't even explain to you the emotions that went through my mind when on every Friday I had to walk into the fighter pilot squadron where I was the only woman and we would have Friday all calls and there'd be 35 fighter pilots kind of staring there and I would walk in and I would quickly hurry to the back of the room while, you know, trying to act like I knew what I was doing. And being the only woman kind of was a little intimidating. And I compare that feeling to the feelings that when I went to Afghanistan and I found another female pilot friend. Her name was Sasha. And we were deployed together in Afghanistan. And when Sasha and I would walk into our new flying squadron, there'd be 200 guys looking at us. And we strolled in like we walked off the cover of Cosmopolitan magazine. <laughs> and you could just see the guys like drooling, you know. We had the confidence. And wherever Sasha and I would go, we had a following. We got free stuff at restaurants. We got drinks from strangers. We walked on water together. So definitely find the woman on your wing that wants to help you that knows what you need, that understands how you are feeling, and will always be there no matter what issue is confronting you. If you ever find yourself isolated in a challenging situation, be intentional about finding that woman to fly on your wing. Number four, faster and funnier as I say. Finally, well, actually four, it's women leaders who take that primary role instilling honor and character. It's the character traits such as perseverance, wisdom, humility, and kindness. I've also found that it's the women who are more intentional about forming mentoring relationships. I think back on the pivotal points in my life so far, and I always see a female mentor who guided me through that next obstacle. I think of my mom, who introduced me to the Air Force Academy. I think of Linda, who got me into powerlifting. I think of Tess, who got me through T-38 training. And I think of Zena, a fellow A-10 pilot, who commiserated with me during tough times. Women tend to be relationship builders, and we're willing and able to build honor and character in others. And finally, number five, women leaders set the standards of conduct, both professionally and personally. It's taken me years to figure out that women leaders are the ones who actually set that standard for what conduct is appropriate. This aspect of our leadership is, um, is actually a bit more difficult to discuss and is actually um, a little bit taboo. It's been my own personal failures in this area, which has forced me to learn to speak up for myself, and it's what motivates me to share you a couple little stories. Multiple times I've been tested with men in the workplace who have a habit of using physical touch as a way to communicate with women. For instance, I most have, often have seen that men use subtle touching either on the arm or the shoulder or on the leg if you're sitting down to influence a woman maybe on his point of view. Yet you notice men don't usually touch each other in this way. It's not necessarily intentional manipulation, I don't believe, although it can be, but it does seem that a male attempt at female relating. 
So if you stop to think about it, most men often experience win women in a touching perspective ever since childhood. Female relatives, mothers, aunts, girlfriends, they make that physical touch when they're greeting them. Men tend to see these warm, nurturing behaviors as the way that all women relate. I believe that many men have not learned to separate those personal contexts with women in the context of a professional setting. There is no workplace environment I can think of where touching would be appropriate. Women take on a leadership role of setting that standard and intentionally re-educating men who have not learned to transition away from that. Strong women leaders can recognize this behavior and neither exaggerate the issue into crisis nor rationalize it into something less than the real problem, but to tactfully address it and make one more small improvement in women's lives. We must wisely use these opportunities to impart clear expectations of proper social contact. And this takes strength and courage. And on those occasions when someone has crossed the line, I've learned that saying nothing just reflects upon your own standard and what you're willing to accept. I think it's well worth your time and effort to spend a little time thinking about what you value as a woman and what standard you will establish as a strong female leader. And setting that standard also applies for appropriate small group talk. Almost every time I've entered into a new group dynamic, it seems like when the group is composed of men, within the first few hours or days, the group tests the limits of verbal jokes and foul language that's going to be acceptable in that group. And they always, almost always try to validate it with that woman there. I think of a colleague who once jovially said to me, as we were kind of bantering back and forth, he's like, hey, well, Priscilla doesn't mind coarse jokes. She's like one of the guys, right? So many times I fell into this little trap of granting permission to be disrespectful and this dialogue because I, I did, I wanted to be one of the guys. But I've since learned that this question is the first flag that I should be expecting. And now I'm mentally prepared with a quick response to say, Actually, I just prefer respectful language. That's the way we as women can provide leadership in group settings that will help establish a tone and standard for mutual respect. There are just a few differences I've noticed so far where women have unique leadership roles. Sometimes leadership roles can turn into battles for power. And it is so important that we take the high ground and stand up for principles. It's the principles of integrity, compassion, and understanding that will build bridges in our leadership situations. It's definitely not easy. You know, I just took office as an Idaho state legislator 10 months ago. And I've had people, <laughs> I've already, just in the last 10 months, had people, some of them women, try to deter me from my principles. Because of my position as a leader, I've had people think they can easily intimidate me or try to physically strong arm me, or if refuse to provide me the services offered by their business. I was even uninvited to a speaking engagement by a church group. I guess shunning can be a powerful stimulus, but I do want to do what's right, and I've chosen to stand up for the principles in the face of these obvious power plays. After spending a thousand combat hours in Afghanistan, being in a squadron full of men, these tactics don't deter me, and I hope you too, as strong women leaders, can see the importance of your mission and can come to understand your unique abilities in our community. Standing strong is so important, and it's such an important part about being a leader. So let me ask one more time, how many of you really feel like you can be a leader, a strong female leader in our community? Thank you. Okay, Shelly G, I'm over my time. I'm gonna just finish up here, so I hope some of my stories have encouraged you, inspired you in your roles as a leader. Um, and after um, my speaking engagements earlier this year, I had a, a woman ask me if I would write my um, stories in a book. And so today I can officially let you know that I have now written a book. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I found out that the Air Force needs to review it first to make sure there's nothing top secret in it. So I'm going to be pre-ordering them back at the speaker's table. So if Today, if you pre-order a book, I'll give you a stealing deal for $10. And I really just want to encourage women. So, and I'd also, at the last slide, like to inspire um, a, a local author or um, artist who helped put some artwork into my book. And she drew these up for me just in about 12 hours. So I think it's um, Danae in the back. You can raise your hand. But thank you so much. Now go ignite the light. <laughs>